Alicia, Wynn said we should introduce our um, presentation title. So mine is Practice Makes Perfect, IPM Strategies and Production Practices for Managing Pests. And uh, I know there are some of you all that I know and some that I don't, but for, for those of you that I haven't met yet, I've worked a lot with IPM and it's sort of a, a pet a pet topic of mine. Okay. So just briefly, I have a little bit of background information I'm going to give you. Wynn touched on it when he mentioned the Southern Nursery IPM Working Group or SNPM. And then I'm going to talk kind of the meat of, of the talk are these strategies and practices. And because I don't want to get partly into the talk before I even say what IPM is, um, I don't want to assume everyone knows what it is, I want to tell you right now IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management, and it's using information to make decisions about managing pests. The goal is not to annihilate or nuke every pest out of your nursery or out of the landscape, but to kind of keep, keep them at a dull roar, keep them at a manageable level, put, put resources into controlling the ones that really matter, but recognizing that not all of them are an issue and not all of them are, are leading to problems that, that you have to deal with. And a lot of you are probably doing this as it is. Nobody likes to waste their labor or their, their resources or buy, buy pesticides unnecessarily since they're not particularly cheap. So Wynn mentioned the Southern Nursery IPM Working Group, Nicole and JC and Wynn and I are members. This is a, a big part of our group along with some growers that have served as a focus group, landscapers and growers I should say, that have served as a focus group. From Kentucky, um, Pat Carey and Greg Ammon are members of our uh, sort of advisory board. So just to let you all know. And when we get together, we basically cook up a bunch of work for ourselves. So that's kind of how it works. Is that true, JC? Is that, I think that's fair. <laughs> that's, the way it, that's the way it works for me anyway. But um, so one of the things that we did was we asked uh, growers to take a survey on pest management practices so we could learn more about what they were doing and how we could help them implement more sustainable practices and IPM. So if you took that survey, thank you. It has been very, very helpful. And there have been things directly, um, products, new things that we've been able to do because we had that information. In that survey, this is what growers told us over five states in the southeast. Yes, we use IPM, but here's the reason we don't use it more. First of all, success needs to be demonstrated. I want to see it work. And that's particularly relevant for using biological controls. We're not just going to assume because you read it somewhere that it works. I want to see it work. And that's very reasonable. Growers also said nursery specific IPM information isn't readily available. It's not like corn and soybeans and wheat where it's all down to a science and, and every last detail has been pinned down. And that's very true with economic thresholds. There's a lot of information not out there. The last real barrier that growers had towards adopting different integrated pest management practices was that it, it, they thought it takes too much time. I don't have time to go out there and look for every single pest that might be there. I just need to know they're, they're under control. And again, very reasonable. So my, my goal today is to share some information with you that will hopefully make you feel like these three things are not as much of a barrier as they might seem to be and touch on some basic IPM practices in the process. Wynn mentioned we've been fortunate to get IPM funding for nursery crops in this state. That has led to a lot of um, a lot of things we couldn't have done. This workshop series is going on about 10 years now. It's funded by that, that grant. We had a scouting program for several years where we'd go weekly to nurseries. That was funded by this grant. There are people in the room who were part of that program. We were able to take those weekly findings and generate not only a report for that grower, but have very current information in our newsletter. So we were spreading the benefit of that beyond just the people in the scouting program. So three major things that we were able to do with that money. And this is what growers told us was the benefit of that program. As an example, one grower said, just from, just from the scouting program, just on my maple crop, you helped me preserve 
or save twenty thousand dollars in sales they were protected because you you were you helped me detect a new scale population and precisely uh, time the controls so that I could nip that in the bud before it spread and I could not sell those plants so that's just one instance on one crop Another grower responded in terms of the value of the newsletter that this IPM program fed that he saved about $5,800 just on his redbud crop because he had just found a scale, a calico scale on it and he, he now knew exactly when it was time to spray. We had said crawlers are out. We're, we're monitoring them. We see they're out. Now's the time to spray if you're trying to target the crawlers and he was able to do that. But, of course, IPM is, is not limited to Kentucky and Georgia. There was a big program to look at integrated pest management in landscapes and nurseries. And they found that when nurseries implemented IPM, they reduced their pesticide use by 83%, which is just cutting their costs, just making it cheaper for them to do the same thing they were doing grow plants. And in New Zealand there's a nursery that adopted IPM. They did a complete conversion from calendar sprays to IPM. They factored in all of the costs they had with training their employees about IPM and then also looked at how did it affect how often they're spraying and how many products they had to buy. And they were able to cut their overall pest management costs by a third. So Hopefully, we're, we're kind of ticking these off. Hopefully, I'm, I'm helping to show you that, that six, these are success stories. People have had very good results from implementing integrated pest management techniques. So now we're going to move on to nursery specific IPM information isn't readily available. And that kind of gets into the meat of my talk where I'm going to talk about IPM practices and production practices and how they all kind of relate into pest management. So again, the goal is not to annihilate everything, it's to manage important pests. Put your resources into the ones that are really a problem, only spraying them when you can, you can catch them at a time that they're susceptible, a life stage that you can actually kill, and before they do the damage instead of after the damage is done, because at that point there's no, no point. It takes information, of course, to know all this. That's the trade-off. It's expensive from the standpoint that you, you've got to be in a class, you know, you, you, I'm kind of preaching to the choir. You're here today to learn. But it takes information to implement IPM. That takes time, training, money. Um, it, you are kind of weighing the cost of damage if I do nothing versus the cost of control and how good of control I'll get. And that's a challenge because, as you guys know, your, your landscape clients expect the plants to look healthy. Your, your customers, as for those of you who are nursery growers, they, they want plants to look healthy. Plants are sold based on appearance. We can only sell so many park grade trees. There are only so many markets for that. We don't have a juice market. We don't have, we're not making applesauce. We can't take the coals and do something else with them. Um, to, you know, there's, there's a limit to that. So, so there, there are some real challenges in applying IP to non-edible crops but I think we also have some opportunities and one is because many of our nursery crops are multi-year crops maybe we apply diff we have different standards the years leading up to the year they'll be marketed so things that are just cosmetic some leaf spots things like that can be ignored in the first couple of years now the year you're gonna sell them that's important if you're a B&B &B grower a lot of that stuff is not important They're, the customers not gonna have the plant you're gonna give it to them dormant they're not gonna have the plant with leaves on it so there's some flexibility and some things we can use to our advantage I think so here are the main components of an IPM program First of all, trying to prevent the problems. We do that all the time anyway. Mapping, scouting, and then recording what you're finding. And scouting is a big, big part of it. We'll talk a lot about that. IDing the pest properly to know is it even really a problem and what's the best way to, to take care of that problem. Using thresholds. Um, deciding that's that's when you're going to spray using the best control, the most appropriate control, and then deciding how did that work. 
So I've slimmed down the prevention talk quite a bit, but I don't want to marginalize its importance. If you can prevent a problem, it's much cheaper in almost every case than dealing with it. Here, these are dogwood liners I got in for, for an experiment. Bare root liners, that's nut sedge, nut, nutlets germinating throughout it. So if I had 10,000 of these, could I pick them all out? No. But if you have 500 of these and you don't already have nut sedge, it might be worth your while. You might save more money in the long run by getting rid of those from the beginning or rejecting the liners or what have you than to plant them and now have a field with nut sedge in it. And the same goes for a landscape. Getting any weeds out of the pot or that have started to grow in the root ball out now can, can be helpful down the road. Unless you get to charge extra for weed control, then maybe it's a good thing. But <laughs> um, borers, of course, they have to be controlled. That, that's, they have to be controlled by preventative measures right from the beginning. Weeds are best um, controlled preventatively if you have the option. So here's a case, here's a nursery. These are all going to seed, all of these weeds. Here's some of the production. Here are the pots he's getting ready to pot up into, now covered up in weed seeds. This substrate's now infested with the weed seeds. And there's the new crop getting ready to go out with a healthy dose of weed seeds in it. So. It's, it's easy for me to preach this. This is, you know, this is one of those important but not urgent things. No one's screaming at him, go control those weeds, go weed eat those or spray them. There are other things knocking on his door, telling him, stop what you're doing and take care of this. But if you can make time for these sorts of preventative things, you can end up saving yourself a lot of time. And in the longer version of the talk, I go into that quite a bit. But time, time management is a big part of the prevention strategy. I also think as part of preventing problems or quickly diagnosing them, really staying abreast of problems in the area where you're buying your liners. So if you, if you buy liners from Tennessee, look to see what pests are a problem in Tennessee right now. If you buy liners from Oregon, the same thing. This was an undiagnosed problem. The growers bought the liners, got them in, they looked fine until they got the stems wet and then these, these rust colored cankers became evident. And we asked at every meeting we went to, didn't we win for months we tried to track this down and ultimately it went back to the source of the liners was Oregon and looking in their literature and talking with their experts we were able to see what what the, what this was actually aerial phytophthora something that's not normally a problem here but by keeping up with problems in their area we were able to eventually track it down so I mentioned scouting is a big part of IPM and you want to start out with a map you want to scout once a week to get the full benefit of it. You, want, you, you can use traps as well as just visually inspecting the plants themselves. You can also um, monitor nutrition. Use the pour through technique for those of you that grow container plants. That can be a, be a very big aid in heading off problems, whether they're nutritional or pest related. And I'll talk about how the two, uh, the two of those are related, nutrition and pest problems, in a little bit. And then scouting also helps you monitor the control measures that you have applied, seeing how well they worked, what needs to be done now. So it's good to start out with a map. It's good to have a uniform map and uniform names to refer to, to um, different parts of the nursery. Those of you that are in landscape, that's kind of done for you because you have the owner's property name or the address and that makes it very simple. But a lot of times it's a, it's, you, you don't really know where you are in a nursery. I like this because every single person that drives in knows where they are. They know what's been sprayed, that's in red, and they know the re-entry interval. And that's really important if someone's going to be scouting, touching the plants, turning leaves over you know we, you want to make sure there's really clear communication about where they should be and where they shouldn't be. Purdue has a nice um, scouting publication online if you if you google it it's publication E213 and they have this record keeping form in it. If you're going to go to the trouble of scouting I would write down what you find and I would keep those. They've been a great benefit to me to all these records that I have from years of doing the scouting program. They help me anticipate when, when new problems will arise. They're invaluable. So I mentioned scouting is the heart of IPM. 
it, this is where growers really tell us you've helped me save money you've been an extra set of eyes you've been you've helped me identify things much faster than I would have come across them on my own I just don't have that much labor so basically it's monitoring the pest population whether it's a landscape or a nursery you do have to have a certain amount of knowledge you got to know what the pests look like that you're looking for and so on some people will argue, well, I'm just going to find all these things and then I'm going to spray even more. And may maybe if you, if you um, offer that as a service, that's a good thing. But I think the, in a lot of cases, you, and especially for the nurseries in the audience, you can kind of, you can find it now while it's small and isolated and it's cheap, cheaper and you have more options of how to control it. You know, BT will kill a small caterpillar, not a big one, that sort of thing. Or it can spread and grow if natural enemies don't keep it in check, and then you're spraying many more acres, and it's costing you a lot more. So I think finding it now, and, and maybe you see a bump in what you spray now, is that's not bad. Another, another thing growers will sometimes say, and, and landscapers who've been in the business a while, I, I kind of know, you know, there's sort of a calendar. I kind of got, a, I've got an idea of when things emerge, and, and that's true. But we we have very um, unpredictable weather. Not every season's the same, and this season's a good example of that. So to go strictly by the calendar can can um, lead to lead to problems in in some seasons. It depends, but th it's a good place to start. I mean, I, I I wouldn't discount using a calendar completely. It's just not going to be at, like clockwork you know it's not going to happen exactly so the reason we scout is to quantify a pest population how many of them are there is it enough that I need to spray and to help detect this year-to-year -year seasonal variation it gives you very real-time um, very location specific emergence information that you can use to to determine if you need to spray or not do you need to scout every plant? No, that's impossible. And I think that's why a lot of growers put on the survey, we don't have time for IPM. If, if the perception is you've got to scout and in, uh, you know, every plant you have or even half of your plants, then, then I, would, I would think that too. But you really only need to scout the most susceptible plants. If you have the pest, that's where it's going to show up. So this is maple tip moth on red sunset red maple, and that's a great place to look for it. If you're growing red sunset red maple and you're concerned about this pest, that's where I would look. There's a lot of information out there, um, and a lot of it's been condensed for you in a tool that I'm going to show you in just a little bit. This is, this is one piece of information. Um, this is someone's master's thesis, and they looked at how resistant or susceptible different maple cultivars are. So if you're scouting for, in this case, red uh, flat-headed apple tree borer, if you grow Burgundy Bell, that's the place I would scout for it. If you have that in your landscapes, that's the place I would scout for it. And, and, and these others that were more heavily infested, that makes your scouting efficient. You're not, you're not looking for it down here where you're not as likely to find it. Not only are you not scouting every plant, you don't need to scout every, um, every week for every pest that you know. Um, one of the... Oh, one of the um, publications that I'm going to show you in a little bit condenses the season down into the, this chart. So on the left hand column are the most relevant pests for deciduous shade trees and some shrubs. And then across the top is February through August. So of course you don't need to read this, I just want to illustrate that this shows you that there are only a few weeks that you need to be concerned about these different pests. And some of them you can even knock out in the dormant season in February. So if you, if you look at the fact that you're scouting just the most susceptible plants and just during the weeks when that pest is most relevant, now it's becoming a much more manageable task. And the same thing for um, diseases. Some of this is monitoring for infection, the conditions that are right for infection, and some of these letters signify actually seeing if infection has occurred so you can prevent secondary infections where you just keep getting more and more spores released and more and more leaves infected. Traps can be a big part of scouting. Um, 
Often they use a lure, although there are some visual traps. The lures are often a pheromone or like a perfume um, or ethanol, which stressed trees release and a lot of boars are attracted to ethanol. They tell us, by, by monitoring traps, we know when the pests emerge and we know how many of them there are. And, and that matters because it's going to vary from nursery to nursery, from field to field, from season to season. And what happens is um, we don't have unlimited resources. We don't have all the time in the world. We don't have seven tractor drivers. We don't have 15 people licensed as sprayers for landscapes. You have to prioritize what you're going to spray. So the traps help you tell where the population is the heaviest, where you need to be most concerned about it. And of course, client demands are also important. If, you've got, if you have clients that are very reluctant to have any damage, they're on a different threshold than ones that might, might be more interested in a sustainability approach and know that you're not spraying over every little thing. They're willing to tolerate a little bit of damage. <coughs> So th this is granulate ambrosia beetle, for, for those of you that haven't seen it before. This is what the pest looks like, and this is the, the ethanol-based trap that we use for it. And here's one of our nursery scouts hanging it up with a grower, but the names have been changed to protect the innocent here. But um, so this has been an incredible tool for us because this has been a destructive pest um, in nurseries and in landscapes, but more so in nurseries. We come closer to having a monoculture in, in nurseries, so pest problems, I think, tend to be more magnified. But this is the number of beetles per trap. This is as the season go goes on. This is spring. So basically, research has shown if you spray timed coincide with the first flight, you're going to prevent a lot of granulate ambrosia beetle problems. If you don't know when this is and you don't spray to here or here or here because you're guessing, then you will have a lot more incidence of damage. And, and a lot of people would recommend and then spray every three weeks. So it, it does fly. You can see it flies for a long time, but most of the damage occurs early on. And J.C. Chong here, is this, uh, he's in our working group. He's one of the speakers. J.C. is an entomologist, so feel free to um, jump in, J.C., at any time, correct? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not an entomologist, but um, I've worked with this for a while, but certainly defer to J.C.'s expertise. So, And all the hard questions go to J.C., too, for sure. This is just a um, plug for considering using more than one trap. If you look at the solid blue line, that's one trap in one location. If you look at this very light green line, this is another trap in a nearby location, but different location. And you can see, I got 80 in this trap, I got 160 in this one. So where you put the trap can make a big difference and it really helps to have more than one trap because sometimes I will only get two or three ambrosia beetles in a trap that doesn't mean there are only two or three out there and you can kind of marginalize in your mind the significance of that pest based on having a few in your trap but the reality is if you look at, the, if you look at your nursery um, diff with traps in different locations, you may find there are hot spots. And then those are areas you would target with spraying. This trap that caught 160 was closer to water. So I don't know if that made a difference or if it was something else. They, they both were near a tree line. When I talk about trapping with growers, a lot of them say what, what I just said. I'm not an entomologist. I wouldn't know what I saw in a trap, so how's it going to help me? And that, that's pretty legitimate. I was worried about the very same thing, and, and I was lucky to be at UK and have entomologists you know, down the hall. But what I found is, first of all, there's the pictorial guide that I just showed you. Second of all, these lures are pretty good. This is where there, there was a lure here, it's been removed, and here's a different type of lure right there. Some of them are very specific, and you can see if the light was a little, if it was a little less light, it'd be easier to see, but there's a whole bunch of one thing in here. And this is a pretty specific lure, and it fits the description of lilac borer. So I feel pretty comfortable, it's the right time of year, that's why I had that trap and that lure out, I thought I'd catch them. And, and this, oh, don't worry about it, Wayne, it's not, it's not a big deal. But, and the same thing for lesser peach tree borer. I have the trap out because I know it's about the time they should be flying. And I've caught a whole bunch of one thing in the lesser peach tree borer trap with that lure. Now some lures are not quite as selective, but it's not as daunting of a task as it seems. 
So for the scouting program, we also made sort of makeshift traps. We, would, we were trying to detect when the crawlers or the immature stage um, emerged because if you're going to use a contact insecticide, that's going to be the most, um, that's going to be the easiest stage to control. So again, this is an example of how IPM takes a little bit of knowledge. We first know that we're talking about the calico scale, okay? Calico scale is a soft scale, and I don't know everything about every scale out there, but I know in general the soft scale that I deal with in nurseries, they swell up, they lay eggs, and then the crawlers hatch, and they go up to the leaves. So we put this trap, this sticky trap, over the dying females. And it's hard to see in here, but all these little like straw-colored flecks are actually crawlers. So we've trapped some of them and prevented them from infesting the tree just by having this here, but it allowed us to monitor them. Now we know, right now is when you want to spray. And it's really critical with scale because they start to develop that waxy coating and then insecticides are not as effective. It's much more difficult to kill them the older they get. And here you can see one much magnified but up against the leaf vein. And that's, that's where they're headed. So knowing that little bit about them lets you very efficiently trap for them. You're not looking willy-nilly all over a, a, a 20 foot tree. I alluded to this earlier. We can scout for diseases. We know what the symptoms look like. We know what the, the likely um, host plants are. We can go out and look for them. And in the case of powdery mildew and apple scab and some others, this is helpful because they can keep reinfecting the new growth or other plants. Um, for other, other diseases, once the infection's occurred, it's really too late. But we can monitor the environmental conditions that are conducive to infection. And Mariblite is a program that allows you to do that um, for fire blight. Cougar blight does the same thing. And this is actually a workshop that we did with landscapers and growers in Elizabethtown in 2004. And we brought in laptops and we went through simulated weather conditions that are, that are typical in the spring and how, how you see all the factors that have to fall into place to know if infection occurs. And it's pretty simple. How wet is it? How warm is it? And is the plant in bloom? And the, and the program lets you know you have a very high risk right now. So if this is an important disease to you, go spray. So I mentioned that economic thresholds or action thresholds are part of IPM. They're a big part because we don't want to spray for every little thing. We've, we've scouted, we see we have something, we've properly identified it, now we want to know what to do about it. And we know how many we have because we were monitoring it. Well, this is difficult because, I mentioned earlier, customers expect plants to look good. In, in exit surveys of garden centers, they, they say, I want a symmetrical plant, I want it to be green, I don't want it to have damage. And yet, we know there are, there are mass merchandisers and other stores that are able to sell something less than a number one grade all day long. So there's a range of customers out there, and it's really based on what your clientele expects. And also, can you sell a sustainability kind of angle? As a, as a landscape manager, can you say, look, I'm not going to spray every month, but I, I would set you up with a service contract to scout every month, and then we'll only spray if we need to. That appeals to some clientele because they don't, they're, they're into sustainability, they're into green, they don't, they, their kids are playing in their yard, they don't necessarily want it sprayed, but they might be willing to pay you to scout. So there, there are different angles you can use with different types of clientele. It's true that there aren't very many economic thresholds developed for, for ornamental crops and I think the customer is the reason why. It really varies. You can establish your own using your records knowing, hey, if I let, if I let mites get up to this level, I get too much damage. I gotta kinda, I gotta head them back before I get 50 per leaf or whatever. So you can, you can establish your own. You can use different thresholds the year prior to sale, like I mentioned earlier, and you can work the angle of if you're gonna be selling something B&B, &B, you might not have to worry about a whole lot of things. So this, th these thresholds are a little bit like triage. They help you prioritize how important is a particular pest and is it something I really need to deal with. So if I stick to leaf spot, I'd put on the, that's a band-aid, you know, that's like, oh, I cut my knee, but I'm in the emergency room kind of thing. It's cosmetic. 
if you're selling a B&B plant, I wouldn't worry about it. If you have clientele that are more interested in environmental things than having every leaf perfect, explain to them. It's just cosmetic. It's not a problem. Now, if you're a container grower, you might need to control that. Garden centers might reject that. La landscapers might reject that. A bore, to me, is like, to the average public, like a bed bug. One is too many. So, you, you, you know, you're not going to sell this tree. It doesn't matter if it lives or not. It's completely scarred up. There's a big old exit hole from the flat-headed apple tree bore. This, this had to be prevented. So it has a zero threshold. Maple spider mite, and that, that one's more gray area. Yes, the mites reduce photosynthesis because they're removing chlorophyll. The leaf isn't totally green. They multiply rapidly. A lot of mites go from egg to egg in about a week. So you can, you can really get an explosion. So again, using your knowledge, you can say, hmm, I know that mites in hot, dry weather really explode. What's the forecast? You know, I'm going to factor that into my decision to spray. If we're expected to have kind of cool, kind of overcast, maybe a hurricane has moved through and is bringing that kind of weather, well, then maybe you hold off. Um, this, and, and, and this also has some leaf, foliar leaf spot too, but there's a lot of spider mite. This was a very, very, this was 2007, very hot, very dry. Um, you might consider, well, am I selling these field trees or am I selling these as B&B? &B? Because again, what the leaves look like will matter. And you can also factor in how many, how many lacewing eggs, how many, how, many predator, how many predators do I see running around. This is, this is a true story. These are autumn blaze very susceptible to maple spider mite. They also have a leaf spot. Tree, container trees that looked like this were rejected. A whole shipment of them because this is what the retailer expected. They were getting them in in the fall. They were going to sell them based on having that really vivid, bright red color. And when they came in looking like that, he said, I can't sell them. I'm just going to sit on them. So, so even the kind of really, the, the, even all of this is probably pretty much cosmetic that is such a vigorous plant um, that even if it reduced its growth a little bit it'd be, it, it, it might almost be beneficial less pruning that would have to be done but, but that's not what this guy could sell so again kind of goes back to your market what they're looking for what their expectation is and and so forth so if you've decided things are at a level pests are at a level that I need to control them I've got to do something you have several options cultural controls biological controls you can do some things to physically remove the pest and then all the con conventional controls so biological control consists of two options, adding beneficial insects to a landscape or a nursery, or trying to conserve the ones that are already there, or both. Adding them is a little tricky. That's one of those where growers often say, I want to see this work before I spend a lot of money, and I can appreciate that because it is a lot of money and it's a lot more management. You have to know which predatory insects will live well in your hot, humid summer, which ones are really going to go after the pest that you have. What um, You might need to buy the adult instead of the young to be able to feed on your pest. You know, it, re it really can matter. They might not be big enough as an immature to immediately start feeding on your pest. So there are lots of considerations. I've had biological controls held up in the Louisville airport because of tornadoes last year. I mean, there, it's not got a shelf life. You got to pay for overnight delivery. So it's got some things working against it. I can appreciate why growers would want to see it work. And we did this at one workshop. We brought in, um, I think it was lacewing eggs, but I'm not, I, I can't remember now. This was back in 2000. And, um, three and so we had maple spider mites in this field of maples we brought in the biological controls we sprayed the leaves down with water so they'd stick shook them on there so growers had a chance to see and maybe that's you know if you're interested in that try it on a small scale see how it works for you and I've, I mentioned all this previously a lot of cultural control also follows under prevention it, they could go in either category it, it's, it includes using resistant varieties. You're going to prevent the pest problem to begin with. Certain rose cultivars, certain crab apples are more resistant to Japanese beetles, even though in general those are favorite species or um, genera for, for Japanese beetles. beetles. Using a resistant, like an Appalachian spring, 
compared to a powdery mildew susceptible dogwood can save you a lot of spraying, help you get more growth turn that plant faster or keep your clients happier because they're going to be cleaner plants to begin with. I, I worked with a nursery, they, they were new, and they planted a lot of red sunset and a lot of autumn blaze. And I went back to visit them and they had 42% of their red sunsets were dead. <coughs> dead, sticking up in the field or bent over from how weak the, the infestation left the plants. The autumn blaze, side by side, same supplier, planted at the same time, two ro you know, rows side by side, had absolutely no flat-headed apple tree borer. Well, you might not be able to sell as many autumn blaze as red maple. There's probably a red sunset. There's probably more demand for red sunset. But this is a consideration. It takes a lot more money to grow one. You got to spray it a lot more. Getting the right plant in the right place. We talk about that a lot in the landscape, and it's true in the nursery. Here's a little low spot. Those two trees are dead. These are small trees. These are much bigger trees as you get up out of that depression. So maybe that's a field instead of pears, maybe red maples or bald cypress or swamp white oak might do better in that spot. Pruning properly. These are some of these production practices that can affect pest problems. We want to prune um, branches before they are, when, when they are one third the size of the branch you're removing them from or smaller. If they're bigger than that, it's a really big wound. It takes a lot of reserves for that tree to, to seal over that wound. And you can see this pruning cut, this branch was almost the diameter of the trunk it was pruned from. Pruning cuts stress trees. Um, the bigger they are, the more of a stress it is, and these are all attractive to, to certain pests. And they can be entry points for certain pests. That's, that's well documented in the literature. And, and JC could probably give more specific examples on that. Um, proper fertilization. So this was the southwest side, very hot, no roots. Lots of roots here. We also have the whole pile of fertilizer for that three gallon was dumped in one spot. Most fertilizer responds to warmer temperatures. The warmer it is, the more fertilizer is released. Fertilizers are salts. So you, there's also probably some salt burn going on here. And pythium, a root rot pathogen, really likes salt damaged roots. So. The production practices, the fertilization, and the pest management are really all related. So spreading that fertilizer around the pot could reduce the amount of salts that are right there. Using white pots or a little bit of shade could maybe help reduce the temperature, the dramatic temperature um, increase that's occurring on that side of the spot, that side of the pot. There's also um, you know, a thought more is better. And I want my plants to grow faster. I want this tree to fill in for my client. I, I want to turn this crop faster so the faster I can get it to this size and harvest it, the better. And, and, and so that's kind of pulling on us. But on the other side, there's a lot of information that, that over fertilized plants are more susceptible to diseases and to insects. So in the case of diseases, you have very succulent tissue that's, some diseases can just directly penetrate the leaf tissue. So the softer it is, the easier it is for them to do that. That's why we sometimes get fire blight on suckers because they, you know, they are so succulent. They grow so quickly, and the the the, the bacterium is just is just entering in. So there's a lot of a lot of literature out there on insects and fertilization. And Dan Herms did a program for us, I think in 2006, and he, he went through this in a lot of detail, so I'm, I'm not going to. But I want to make you aware of just, the, you know, there's sort of a preponderance of evidence that the higher the nitrogen fertilizer, the more nutritious that plant is for the insect. So this has been documented with aphids, with mites, with adelgids, with scales, with psyllids, with plant bugs, with lace bugs, and with spider mites. 
So maybe not with borers, but with pretty much everything else that causes us problems, there, there have been scientific studies that have documented that either the, the capacity to reproduce or the body size, their survival percentage is greater the greater the, the nitrogen is. And it's not in every case for every insect on every plant, but in general this is seen over and over again. And the reason why is just like for plants, nitrogen is, is, can be one of the major limiting nutrients for insect development. So if you're giving it to them, they're going to grow. They're going to be healthier. So here you can kind of see this is eastern tent caterpillar. This is how big the larvae were. This was at 50 parts per million nitrogen, 200 parts per million nitrogen, 350 parts per nitrogen. And you can see you get a bigger bug the more you fertilize the plant. On poplar, there was a similar effect with gypsy moth. The more you fertilize, or excuse me, with white marked tusset moth, the more you fertilized it, the bigger the larval growth, or the greater the, the larval growth. So we could talk about that for an hour, but there's, there's a lot to that and it's definitely something to think about because it's not cheap or free to fertilize your plants and it's not cheap or free to, to take care of insect problems that arise. So if you can find some balance between growing the plants fast and healthy and looking good for your customers, but also not inviting pest problems, that's a good thing. Sanitation is a big part of cultural control. Again, it's helping you prevent problems. So cleaning pots between use, cleaning your pruning shears between landscape sites so you're not bringing one, one um, disease or, or insect with you from property to property. You can mechanically or physically remove some pests and that really depends on your type of business and your labor situation. Um, as an example, I, I've worked with a grower who it what he felt it was to his advantage economically to in the winter have his labor that didn't have a lot to do hand pick the the bagworms off his arborvitae. He didn't grow a ton of them. It gave his labor something to do. He didn't particularly like spraying, and when it was time for spraying bagworms, he was busy with a lot of other stuff. So by just getting the source of the the um, new generation out of there. He, he thought that was a win-win situation. You can easily prune out eastern tent caterpillar egg masses if they're not on the trunk. You know, if they're on a small side branch, and, and they often are, then you can just prune those out. And we know which plants are most susceptible to, the, to egg laying. We know which, which species the female eastern tent caterpillar prefers to lay her eggs. So you can even be very targeted and efficient about knowing where to look to see if you have them to cut them out. Again, you don't have to look through the whole nursery. This might not be um, appropriate in all cases. Chemical controls in IPM, you'd kind of use them as a last resort. IPM's not organic. You have the full spectrum of products at, at, um, available to use, but you wouldn't jump out and use the most toxic thing if there's something else that works. So, and, and is cost effective. So by scouting, now you've detected your bagworms when they are a half inch long or less. So now products such as BT are an option. You know, something that's not quite as toxic you could use. And that would be kind of in the, that would be in the spirit of IPM, using something that's not going to annihilate everything, but kind of target that one pest and, and be relatively safe for, for people and other uh, natural enemies that might be in the in the area. There, there is getting to be more and more research documenting how our approach to spraying might actually be triggering other pest problems. One study I want to mention um, is one of our fellow SNPM members, um, Steve Frank, and, and, a, and a collaborator of his looked at controls for granulate ambrosia beetle because they were finding a preponderance of maple spider mite. And both of these pests kind of arose at the same time. Once we got granulate ambrosia beetle, we also started seeing a lot of maple spider mite. Once we got granulate ambrosia people, a, a beetle, a lot of growers started making more 
air blast applications because it is a lot it's a lot more efficient to go through with the air blast sprayer and hit your trees than go one by one like this but what they found is if they used a directed application they had for granulate ambrosia beetle they had 50% fewer spider mites on those same plants and 50% more beneficial insects so we may be wiping out a lot of natural enemies that were kind of keeping things under control when we had to ramp up air blast sprayer applications or did for, for granulate ambrosia beetle. Some, some similar work, um, imidacloprid was used I think for Asian longhorn beetle in, in New York City, I think in Central Park. And what they found is out of the blue this spider mite that had previously been just an obscure thing documented in some book somewhere but people really didn't see exploded on these trees. And what they found is that that the predators of this spider mite were poisoned by eating spider mites that had been exposed to the imidacloprid. So here's here the, the black are untreated plants and the, and the red are treated plants and these are the two natural enemies of this spider mite and their their feeding rate was um, much lower when when they were feeding on treated things treated pests and their mobility they weren't moving around a lot to where they could find other mites to feed on when their food source was imidacloprid tainted spider mites so there was an effect on the natural enemies that normally kept this spider mite under control. It also operated in a different way. The imidacloprid elevated the reproductive capacity of this spider mite. So that also contributed to, and, that, and that's documented, that, that happens um, in other cases with, with spider mites where sprays actually lead to more and it's separate from the effect on the natural enemies. In a separate study, a group out of Maryland looked at making, in a landscape situation, cover sprays, three cover sprays a year for four or more years, and compared that when there, were, um, there was less, uh, less frequent treatments made. And what they found is there were a lot more scale pests, the more often they did these cover sprays, and the plants were more likely to have a scale problem the more frequently they made the cover sprays. And even fogging communities for mosquito control has been linked to natural enemy decline and, and pine needle scale populations increasing. So there's actually a lot of literature about this connection out there. So I bring it up just so you can be aware of how some of the practices that, that you're doing to control pests can inadvertently lead to other pest problems for you. I want to mention briefly a couple resources. One is a book that um, Wynn and Nicole and JC and I have been working on and um, it is available right now online. There are limited print copies available. It is soon to be on iBooks for those of you that use an iPhone or an iPad. And also, and I'll just pass this around uh, very quickly, I, I talked a lot about um, scouting, oh excuse me, a lot of the real specifics about scouting are in that publication. So I mentioned you don't look just any time of year and not just on any, any plant, you look on the susceptible ones and you don't need to look at every susceptible plant, you pick out a few. But this tells you where and how to look on the plant so it's really refined down to a very efficient process to scout. Also, um, when, in, when and JC and I have been working on a, an app and it is available in Android and iPhone uh, marketplaces right now. It's for nursery and landscape professionals and we did this with our focus group. They advised us on how to develop this so that it would be helpful to nurseries. It gives you text-like alerts. Um, every week for the pests and the production and landscape tasks that are most relevant that week. And then you can launch the app from that text-like alert. You actually don't need a text package, it's a push notification. So um, it's not going to cost you if you pay, you know, if you pay 10 cents for every text, it's, there's not going to be a charge for you. You can launch the app from that text-like alert and it'll give you a calendar view or a list view. It gives you lots of information and it allows you to do electronic record keeping. So if you're 
if you're out in the field or you're an, on a big estate or s someone's landscape and it's easier to use your phone than have a clipboard that you drag around with you, you can enter or paste in from other parts of the app what you've applied and it will email that to you and it's cumulative so every pesticide application gets emailed to you every time so you have this chronological list and then you can print that off and have that as your your record you can also keep it on your computer so this is what it looks like on on my iPhone it's called IPM Pro you probably saw that on the screen but I would just click launch and it would bring me to the calendar view that's sort of our homepage. This is October of last year, so this is sort of a, 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 a dummy month, if you will. There aren't any alerts on that month. And I can also click list and go to the list view and scroll through these. I can, it, here, is, here is March, so there are lots of alerts in March. You can see Saturday and Sunday. We, as a group, decided we're doing this in the spirit of IPM. We don't want people to get this at a random, you know, 9 o'clock on a Wednesday morning when they're in the middle of stuff. They can't stop and deal with this text. We, we want them to be planning and, and thinking about preventing pests. So all of the weed and horticulture task alerts are on Saturday and the insect and disease ones are on Sunday. They come at 4 o'clock, so you have time to be processing that, thinking about what's coming up the next week. What do I need to be getting in place for for my crew on Monday morning so they have what they need. So if I clicked on any one of those, and again you can go into the list view and see them chronologically by, by their name, then, then I would click on any one of those, then I can pull up, um, in this case this is Azalea lace bug, and it's going to give you information on it which includes host plants, the symptoms, um, and pest ID the life cycle of that pest, but just the nuggets, you know, just what you need to know. It's not a dissertation. And then how you would monitor for that pest. It's going to give you um, management information. It's, and then it's going to give you, you can see here, the chemical controls and pictures. And Azalea lace bug, we have four pictures of it. I'm only showing you two of them. But we have, a, we have every alert has um, pictures. There might be one or two that don't where it was not appropriate. It was something that didn't have to do with a visual thing. But by and large, and then the controls are listed based on what site you are. And then, you know, on an iPhone, you can just press and hold and then copy and paste that into your treatment record if you want. So this, you could press on here for the treatment record and you'd enter that in. And I'm not going to walk through that because that's um, probably not really enough time. It's, it's very simple. You just fill in the information like you would if it was a record keeping book that you kept in your office, but it's on your phone. Here's an example of one of the horticultural tasks. It's the last date to apply controlled release fertilizers in the summer or else the plants might grow too late in the fall and not be hardened off by the time cold weather comes and then you'd have cold damage. So there's an explanation of it. It's very brief. What's going to happen if you maybe don't do this? Um, and then there's more, there's management information, no chemicals of course, and then there are also images of this, but for time's sake I won't go into all that. There are lots of diseases in it, the most common diseases um, in, in, the, in the eastern half of the U.S. are in here. One example is powdery mildew. These are again the host plants, what it looks like, how you can ID it, what the life cycle is, and then how you would manage it chemical controls and again we have eight images but I'm just showing you one but you can see lots of examples of that. You can go to ipmproapp.com there's a website you can read more about it see how more about how it works if you would like to um, and again it's in Android and in the IPM um, excuse me in the Apple marketplace is the App Store so you can you can find it there it, it's $24.99 it's a one-time purchase you don't have to buy it every season so I think it's you know considering the references what it costs to be here today what it costs to buy a reference book I mean considering that it is constantly updated um, we feel like it's ac actually a bargain and in fact we've already updated it even though we just released it we added um, boxwood blight we're getting ready to add rose rosette on knockouts because um, some of our pathologists have said you know I, c I don't see a rose that doesn't have rose rosette now it's our number one um, call it's our number one symptom in the diagnostic lab so hopefully I've showed you also um, 
kind of knocked away this second myth that nursery specific IPM information actually is available. We don't have every economic threshold out there, but there's a lot to go on that can make it easier and give you some peace of mind um, when, kinda, when, when implementing IPM. And the last one is just a slide or two. IPM takes too much time to implement. So I talked about the scouting program quite a bit. We scouted once a week. Our scouts spent more time driving to the locations than they spent scouting. And it's because of all the information I just mentioned. We had it down to a science. We're not looking willy-nilly wandering through just to see what we can find. We had specific plants we were going to on specific weeks of the summer. We knew exactly what pests we were looking for, what that pest looked like, and where on the plant we should look for it. So it was very efficient. Um, we, gave, we did prepare a weekly report to the growers. That took about 30 minutes. And growers told us that it, in, on average over about five years, the scouting program saved about $9,200 per nursery in either preventing unnecessary sprays or controlling pests that would have been devastating because they knew exactly when to spray for that pest or found it for the first time in their nursery. That happened a couple of times. Of course, the, you know, growers didn't have to pay for this. We had this grant for it. So you can say, well, yeah, it saved them money. They had no cost. Well, it cost us about $2,500 per nursery to scout for us from about March until the end of July. About 1500 of that was travel. On average, it cost about $100 to get to a site and back. So you all, if you had scouts, would not have that same kind of cost. We had, we, had pro, we had nurseries all over in the program so that we could get our benefit beyond just, you know, Fayette County. We wanted the state to benefit as much as possible. So, you know, you're talking about an hour of labor a week once they're trained. So hopefully that takes that last barrier um, off of this list. Hopefully you all feel like IPM will, is, is not so time consuming that it's not worthwhile, that it's not cost effective. Thank you and I don't know if we have time for questions but I'll be around if people, if people have questions later. This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.